great turnout today. Thank you all. Are you having a great convention so far? Woo! Yeah! yeah. All right. Well, to get uh, our Thursday going right, we've got Lance Werner here. Lance has served as the Executive Director for Kent District Library since 2011. He received a Juris Doctorate degree from Michigan State University's College of Law. Go Green! And his Master's Degree in Library Science from Wayne State University. Warriors. They don't have a good one. I don't know what it is. Okay. This year he was chosen as Library Journal's Librarian of the Year. And in years past, he was the recipient of the Joey Roger Leadership Award from the Urban Libraries Council. Librarian of the Year Award from Michigan Library Association. The uh, Wayne State University Distinguished Alumni Award. And Library Journal's Mover and Shaker Award. Just a few awards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lance is currently involved in the ALA Policy Corps, the Wayne State University's Capital Campaign, the Michigan Library Association Legislative Committee, and the Michigan Political Leadership Course. Thank you for making time and all of that to come spend the day with us. Uh, Lance was recently named as a candidate for the 2021 presidency of the American Library Association. Please join me in welcoming Lance Warner. into a really big room with about with about uh, with about 650 people and kind of felt like everybody was staring at you <laughs> you know what it's I'm probably just being paranoid you know <laughs> anyway I'm, I'm Lance um, and I am a ham and uh, I'm from Michigan don't judge me I don't like you with them either <laughs> uh, Kent District Library, and don't judge this, everybody from Michigan does this, okay? This is a Michigan thing, right? The mitten, smitten with the mitten, right? We're, we are right on the west side here, about 30 minutes from the lake. We um, are Michigan's busiest library. We have uh, 19 going on 20 branches in a bookmobile, um, and we have a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, we call it the family, and that's what it is. Um, we are somewhat cult-like, and you're going to hear more about that. There's lots of chanting, and, uh, you know, we burn a lot of incense and weird stuff like that. It's good stuff. So, uh, yeah, my, um, my presentation today is about uh, kindness, empathy, and love. And I, I selected kindness, empathy, and love because, you know, I've been to a lot of library conferences, um, and I hear a lot of people talking about a lot of tech things and things that are extremely important that are inspiring, but I feel that sometimes it's really valuable to get back to the basics. And I really feel like kindness, empathy, and love are valuable not just in our profession, critical in our profession, but it's also critical in our lives and our communities. I feel like the world right now is suffering from a huge lack of kindness, empathy, and love. And I feel like libraries are a perfect place for people to come get their daily dose of kindness, empathy, and love. I'm also going to tell you about what sets me apart from everybody and why I won all those awards. <laughs> Let me tell you my big secret. You ready? Y'all listen? You ready? Oh, and by the way, if your phone goes off, I don't care. If you fall asleep, I don't care. If you have to get up and leave, I don't care. Do whatever makes you feel happiest. It's still early. Um, here's my big secret. This is what I did. This is my thing. This is what sets me apart. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I am a completely average person. I am no better or worse than anybody else. I'm certainly not the smartest person I know, although I work with the smartest people that I know. I'm certainly not the most handsome person that I know uh, or the most beautiful person that I know. But I don't think I'm too bad my wife does either. I managed to, managed to get her. Um, you know, and I'm not the fittest person um, uh, that I know. I mean, people don't look at me and they're like, are you an ultramarathon to Lance? No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And I'm not the most charming person that I know, but I'm pretty charming. <laughs> pretty charming. You know, and I, I have to say that I feel like uh, I don't even have a job. I feel like I have a calling. I don't feel like my work is work. I am so proud to be a public servant. 
I feel like there's no greater gift in life than to have a life spent in the service of others. And I feel like a life spent in the service of others is a life well spent. And I feel like that's why we're all here, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's why we're all here. That's what gets us up in the morning. I also very much believe that the mushy stuff matters. And it matters a lot more than you might think. And finally, my leadership style is, is I really believe that I'm just one gear in a much larger machine. And that our library is just one gear in a much larger machine of the nation's libraries. And I understand that we're all interconnected. And I understand that something that's bad that happens on the other side of the country has implications for my library. And I understand what we do is so important that it needs to be cherished and protected and promoted. And I understand this is the most exciting time ever in the history of libraries to work in libraries because we, my friends, are in the midst of a change. We are moving forward and the future is going to be bright and it's going to be bright because we are going to make it bright. And we will not be satisfied with anything less than that. So with that, we'll move on. <coughs> By the way, we'll have questions and answers at the end. I have 56 minutes, so I think our questions and answers period might be 45 seconds. So <laughs> when it's your turn, speak fast. <laughs> I have a few theories that I live by. The first one is that there are lessons in all things, good things, bad things. But I happen to know, unfortunately, that pain is a great teacher. And I happen to think that if you happen to have wisdom that you've gained through pain, one of the things that you can do that's so important is to share your wisdom with others to hopefully help them avoid that pain. And by doing that, you can take something that's been so negative for you and make it into something positive and something that's meaningful. And so that's what we're going to do. I believe that human nature is very much like electricity and water. I believe that it flows along the path of least resistance. I believe that convenience and simplicity are valued almost over everything else in life and that people will pay a premium for it. And I believe that that's very important when we consider our service. And I think that's why it's so important when we uh, contemplate removing barriers to service and making things simple and easy. Because you know what gets used? Things that are simple and easy. Well, on my Amazon, so popular, simple and easy. I don't have to go anywhere. I can use my phone, but deliver it to my house. Simple and easy. You know how we can beat the game? Be simple and easy. So please keep that in mind. I also think that when I feel comfortable, I need to push myself. And I'll tell you why in a moment. You gotta understand that our time here, and this is one of my stories, I'm gonna be vulnerable and I might cry, so don't, don't judge me. Um, you have to understand that I, I feel that life's short. And life is short and you don't wait. When my dad was 50, he died of the same brain cancer that killed John McCain and, uh, and uh, Ted Kennedy. And I watched this poor broken man lie on his deathbed, full of remorse and regret. And I decided right in that moment that I'm not going to live my life that way that I'm going to have bigger dreams and I'm going to do the things that I want to do and go to the places I want to go and be the person that I want to be and lay in my deathbed with no regrets. And I'm going to tell you that I encourage you to do the same. I'm going to tell you that you don't want to find yourself in a position where you are sitting on your deathbed or contemplating the end and saying, gosh, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have gone there. I wish I would have said that. I wish I would have, whatever, whatever your thing is. What I'm telling you is to set a point on the horizon and go after it. And don't be satisfied until you get there. Because you don't want to find yourself in that place. Because you don't get another shot at it. You get this shot at it. And what you do is important to all of us, not just you. It's important to every library in this country it is important to every person in this country. What we do is invaluable and critical, and we need everybody on board. Back to comfort. I don't like comfort. I like to be uncomfortable. That's why I volunteer to be here today. <laughs>
I don't like comfort because comfort is a kissing cousin of complacency. And complacency gets us nowhere. And if you find yourself comfortable, know that that point that you set for yourself on the horizon is getting further and further away. And it might not be immediately apparent, but it's happening. And if that happens, then we're getting nowhere. Because if you're not getting anywhere, we're not getting anywhere. And that's not acceptable. We have work to do. I believe that we're not going to discover or find the future. I believe we're going to make it, and we're going to make it today. And I believe that the goals that you set for yourself, if you haven't set them already, I hope you set them now, I hope that you start working on them as soon as this presentation's over. I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to stand up for yourself. And by standing up for yourself and doing the things that are important to you, we can, we can start a revolution, maybe. I mean, there's nothing we can't do together. Because we're a family, all of us. Everybody in this room, everybody in this industry, everybody in this nation, we're a family. And we need everybody to be strong. You only get one shot, man. You gotta run. You gotta run hard, and you gotta do it now. It's a fish. I'm getting a drink of water. When you stand in front of a giant group of people, you get dry mouth sometimes. So, I have one of my best friends in the entire world is named Brian, and I happen to have Brian right here. And I'm going to steal Brian's story, with his permission, of course. So Brian has four kids, and his eldest son's name is John. And John, when he was in middle school, Rockford Middle School, by the way, someone, same one my kids go to, John won a fish, and they named the fish Bruce. And so John came home with Bruce, the little goldfish, in a little plastic sack. And Brian did what any parent would do with his wife, Julie, and they bought a little fish bowl for Bruce. And they put Bruce in the fish bowl, and for, for three years, Bruce swam around and around and around, and around and around and around in this little fish bowl, and around and around and around. And I think it was clockwise because we're in North America. It might have been counterclockwise when we were in the other tournament. <laughs> and so what happens uh, over a period of time with goldfish is Bruce went from being a little goldfish to a big goldfish. And Julie told Brian, she said, you know, Brian, I think we need to get a, we need to get a tank for Bruce because his nose is going to be touching his tail here pretty quick. And it might be he, it might be she, I don't know. I don't think you guys sex the goldfish, but you need to Bruce anyway. So Brian being Brian, Brian went to the store by himself, which is always, anybody who's married, don't send your husband, husband to the store by themselves. <laughs> so Brian didn't buy a 10-gallon fish tank and even buy a 25-gallon fish tank or even a 55-gallon fish tank. No. Nope. Brian bought a 90-gallon fish tank <laughs> for one gold fish. It had a diving board on it, put a whale shark in it. <laughs> and so the day came, it took Brian about a week to get his uh, tank together for Bruce, you know, because you have to get the water just right and you need to partner with the chemicals and all that stuff. And uh, so they were so excited to have the whole family together. They were really thrilled because, you know, the poor Bruce. Bruce was in his little teeny tiny bowl swimming around and around and around. And so Brian got the bowl and he brought it over to the fish tank and everybody was so excited, they were like, we're going to blow Bruce's little fish mine. <laughs> and they tipped Bruce into this giant fish tank. And much to their dismay, Bruce swam around and around and around. <laughs> this is a true story. And Bruce did that for about 10 minutes. And then Julie punched Brian in the arm. <laughs> and uh, so... Bruce finally started, uh, got, you know, because Bruce didn't realize that it wasn't in this big tank anymore. Or he wasn't in this big tank. He, he, didn't really, he didn't realize it wasn't in a little bowl anymore. And, but finally, Bruce's circle started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, Bruce zipped up to one corner and zipped over to the other side, and started swimming all around the tank, was, was really happy. But it took a long time for Bruce to figure out that he wasn't in that little bowl anymore. And he was like, that's Dan, why are you telling us a story about this fish? Let me tell you why. Because all of us are like Bruce. And so is our profession. We're all kind of bound in by our own walls that we put in our own, in, our, in place. Personally, our walls are, you know, self-doubt and fear and all kinds of different things that tell you you can't and so you don't try because so you think you're stuck in this little teeny tiny bowl. And in our profession, things like sentiment and fear and concern keep us bound in. Let me tell you something. We don't have to be bound in. 
We can be whatever we want to be. We can do whatever we want to do. We can do whatever the public needs us to do. We are the most dynamic governmental entity that's ever existed on the face of the, you know, of, the, of, of the earth. We have more flexibility than anybody else. We can rise to the occasion every single time that we have the willingness to do that. We can identify societal needs and meet them. We just got to be willing to do it. So my theory on, on why personally this impacts us the way it does it has to do with stones and balloons. See, my theory is, is that as you go through life, people hand us, hands, hand us stones or balloons. They hand you a stone by telling you something negative about yourself, or they hand you a balloon and tell you something positive about yourself. Stones, of course, weighing you down, and balloons, of course, picking you up. And because of the wonderments of biology, for whatever reason, we're more apt to hang on to those stones. And usually when people tell you negative things about yourself, usually it's somebody you know. Unless it's just some random jerk who comes up to the, you know, the supermarket and you're like, who cares? You know, but if it's somebody you know, I mean, that hurts a little bit. They tell you, they might be trying to help you. You know, you ever got one of those people trying to help you, give you a little bit of advice? It's like, oh, yeah, you get a little fat over there. Yeah, thanks. Drop dead. <laughs> right? Here's the problem. You know it's true if you're sitting there at a desk or something and you have 20 people come up and are just wonderful and just make you feel gushy like, oh, this is amazing. I'm so glad I'm here today. Oh, I love my work. And you have one jerk come up. Who are you going to remember? Tell me I'm lying. Right? You're going to remember the jerk. It just, it's true. It's absolutely true. Um, so... Bottom line is, is that you don't have to hold on to those stones. You trick yourself into holding on to those stones. You trick yourself into believing those things, right? You don't have to do that. That's your choice. You can believe the positive things about yourself and do extraordinary things. I'm just a regular guy, but I've done some stuff. I didn't do it alone. I did it with a team. And one gear. But it's absolutely true that you can do extraordinary things that you don't need to let other people's, and a lot of times they tell you these types of things, they're, they're putting their garbage on you. That's their garbage. That's not your garbage. You know, don't let that hold you down. Don't be weighed down. Believe the positive things that you hear by yourself. You know what I know about you? I know the people that go into public libraries go to public libraries because they want to change the world. I know that they want to make the world a better place. I know that they have servants' hearts and they're altruistic. I don't think they come into public libraries or work in libraries because they want to get rich. <laughs> if, if you're here because you want to get rich, let, please raise your hand. <laughs> you know, I know for a fact that that's not what's going on. And, you know, being a public servant is not a job for weenies, man. It's a hard job. But you do it anyway because you recognize the value of that. So you hold on to your balloons. And my goal today is for you to walk out of here with a handful of balloons and feel like you can conquer the world. Because you know what? You can. The people who change the world are the people that tried. The people that don't are the people that didn't. And if you get knocked down, stand up again. You owe it to yourself and you owe it to the rest of us too. So do it. Kindness is a component of empathy and love, and vice versa. You know, kindness is something that is, is intentional. And a lot of times it requires work, particularly if you're not in a very good mood. And I think living a kind life should be sought for a variety of reasons that we're going to talk about a little bit here. But kindness and public service is critical. It's absolutely critical. And if you are somebody who can't be kind in public service, then please don't be in public service. Please go do something else, because let me tell you something. We're in a big old war here, and you're doing a disservice to the entire profession. We need you to bring your A-game, even when it's hard, every day, and be kind to people, and, and to embrace them. And let me tell you something, when you treat people that way, it lifts you up at the same time. And suddenly the burden of your day doesn't seem as heavy as it was before. So absolutely, kindness in life should be sought. Kindness in public service is critical. Why, personally, looking at the individual, why be kind? There's a bajillion reasons. Being kind to others may make you feel happier. i got to tell you that uh, periodically I battle with depression. 
And sometimes we get, I don't know if any of you have had depression, but when you're depressed, you feel like you're standing in the bottom of a big dark hole and there's no light. So what you do during those times is you, uh, you be strong and you try to reach out and still try to be kind. And I got to tell you, times in my life when I felt that way and I still push myself even though it's hard. Just do what's right, you know, do what's hard. It's helped me to feel better. It's a start. It's a toehold on a kind of a climb, you know. It's a journey to get out of that spot. It increases positive emotions, love, contentment, joy, hope, interest, and decreases negative ones. Surprise, surprise. Kindness might slow aging. I gotta be honest with you on this one, okay? I read this. Um, it definitely doesn't help with the ad bot, okay? <laughs> it's not helping me with the ad bot at all. But I gotta tell you, I bet you know, a lot of people are ashamed of the dad bot. I'm not, because I live, baby. This is how much fun I get. Mean. <laughs> right? Let's hope. Right? And it's not helping me with my eyesight. That's why I got my little readers on here that I keep putting on. But by God, I'll try. And it can decrease chronic pain, so I'm told. I'm also somebody who suffers from back pain. I've had back pain for 20 years. Sometimes it's so debilitating you can't go to work. Sometimes it's so debilitating you can't get dressed. Um, and during those times, I'm hugely dependent on my wife and other people around me. And I don't know if it helps me with my pain, but being kind to them in those moments makes me feel better because I feel like I'm being such a burden on them. And I, I think that uh, it helps me cope with that, at least, the guilt. The guilt of that because if you're somebody who's been in that situation there's a guilt that, that's there and i don't think it needs to be there but it is what it is kindness can create a higher sense of emotional warmth which may reduce blood pressure it hasn't helped me but i'm still working on that too <laughs> yep i have every sort of health problem you can imagine that's absolutely true because i'm middle-aged and it's not going well for me <laughs> Kindness makes for better relationships. Duh. I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Don't need to go down that road. <laughs> Kindness increases empathy. When I was the director of the Capillary District Library, before I came to the Kent District Library, we worked at the downtown branch of the Capillary District Library, which is in downtown Lansing, and happens to be between the bus station, the liquor store, and the park. Which means that the library is where all the homeless people come every day. And my office was in that building, and I got to tell you, most of the homeless people, and probably a third, without embellishing, maybe a third of the people in downtown Branch, each time I was there, were, were homeless, and most of them were schizophrenic. And what a lot of people don't know about schizophrenic people is that, um, as a population, compared to the normal population, they are less violent. And when they come into the library, they come into places, they're scared. And so you develop a sense of empathy and warmth toward them. And, and the way you do that, and you get to know who they are. And so I would spend time with them. I work the floor. By the way, I still do that. I go to all 19 branches. I work the desk. I suck at it. But I think that it's important to have that sort of personal experience. You know, I think that the employees also appreciate seeing me struggle so badly. <laughs> But I spent that time with, with folks. I spent that time with these schizophrenic folks and they developed a comfort level with me. And you know, we started having less problems in the library because they didn't feel scared. You know, imagine being trapped in a nightmare all the time. I wanted to be a rock for them. And kindness develops that empathy and I think that is so important. I think empathy is so critical to what we do. I, I can't state it enough. That's why I've been stating about 500 more times before this presentation's over. Kindness decreases the bias towards others, and is contagious. So guess what we're going to do now? Oh yeah, it's not too suspenseful. Anyway, what I'd like you to do is take the next few minutes, and I would like you to find somebody who you're sitting in close proximity to that you don't know, and I'd like you to tell them something about themselves that's kind. And please don't be creepy. <laughs>
random people. Now, I'm not recommending you go up and use the grocery store unless you like to feel the peas or you like meats. I like spicy foods, so I like to put meats in my tacos, so it's not a big deal. But hey, you know, I'm, but it does feel good to be kind to people. And this comes as no surprise to any of you, I'm sure. And it, it's fun to kind of meet people that way, too. So I, I, I recommend that you practice kindness. And that was a moment where you were practicing kindness. And that was a moment where you were being vulnerable. Because in order to be kind, you have to be vulnerable. Um, so, you know, I just think it's fun to kind of do that once in a while. So, here's a little thing. Kindness does not equal weakness. Don't mistake my kindness for weakness. I am kind to everyone, but when someone is unkind to me, weak is not what you're going to remember about me. <laughs> I went Al Capone. There, I've done, I have, have, I have an Al Capone quote in a library presentation. <laughs> Somebody write that down. I'm serious, I mean, that's the first ever. But it's true. It's tough to be kind. You know, it, it takes courage. Living your life focused on kindness, empathy, and love takes courage, and you must be vulnerable to do it. You have to be authentic. You have to put yourself out there. I think that it's easier to be negative and to just be, you know, apathetic and not put yourself out there. I think you do that because you want to protect yourself. But that's not okay. You know, I think Brian has got the greatest quote of all time here, I think. And what Brian says, which is very true, is that the lowest level of behavior you accept is the highest level of, or you accept is the highest level of behavior you can require or expect. And that's true. So whatever behavior you accept becomes the norm. So if you're working in a library where it's okay to be unkind, and it's okay to be passive aggressive, and it's okay not to care then that's your culture. And not only is it miserable to work there, you're hurting our entire industry. So do better. Frankly, the world is in desperate need of more kindness, empathy, and love. You know, and, and living with kindness, empathy, and love day to day inspires others and creates stronger friendships and stronger community and stronger familial relationships. And I'm going to editorialize. You know, I, I really do feel strongly in my heart that the world, the world is in the state that it's in because there's a, there really is an utter lack of empathy, love, and kindness. And I think all you have to do to know that I'm speaking the truth is watch the news. And it breaks my heart. And then I think, why do we accept that? And then I think, what am I going to do? And I hope you to do the same thing. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to change that? What are you going to do? You're going to be kind. You're going to be empathetic. And you're going to be loving. And if each person makes that commitment, and each person owns that, in libraries and everywhere, we can start a revolution. We can make that the new norm. Because we've accepted a level of behavior that's low. We've let this happen, and we need to stop. We need to get back to caring about each other, and caring about everybody, and realizing that people are just people, and everybody matters. By the way, I'm a feminist. I'm just going to go on record, just so you know. Uh, that's my thing. So I, I really think that there's just so much negativity, and I think that we really need to practice kindness. I also think that one of the big problems that there is is that people always get this sort of, you know, abstractions. They get numbers, they get something they can't emotionally connect to. Let me tell you, if you tell a story that people can't emotionally connect to, you might as well just save your breath. It doesn't do anything. But stories that are authentic and real, stories that make your heart go thumpy, thump, 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 those stories matter to other people as well. And those are the stories we need to tell. I'm going to talk a little bit in a little while here about um, advocacy. Advocacy and relationships really are the reasons why I've received a lot of the recognition that I've received. And that, and I work with the most incredible team in the whole world, 
and yes, I am biased, mm -hmm. and uh, we've done some incredible things. Creating a culture of kindness, empathy, and love in the work environment, in our case within libraries, creates a familial, non-competitive work culture where people feel embraced and valued. The more important lesson here, of course, is that failure needs to be okay. Because if you're not failing, you're not trying. And why are you afraid to fail? That's how we learn. We don't fail at KDO. There's not failing. It's not a problem. Well, there is failing. I mean, there's, there's like the stupid fails, like, oh, I, you know, I just slept in, or, uh, geez, I'm sorry, I've got to sign checks again. <laughs> oh, payroll's not going out again, sorry about that. Oh. You had a bad hangover this morning, couldn't make it into work, geez. Yeah, that's, that's not an acceptable fail. But if you're reaching, if you're reaching and you're falling down, then you're doing it the right way. And if you, each, if everybody here does that, all 650 of you, think of the things we could accomplish. We could really change the world. We could really make libraries what they need to be. We could really effectuate societal change. We just got to believe in ourselves. We got to hold on to our balloons. I believe in you. I do. I know you can do all these things because I've done a lot of these things. And there ain't nothing special about me at all. Not a darn thing. Nothing. My teenagers will tell you that's for sure. They're like, no way. <laughs> In fact, that it's embarrassing to be seen outside of <laughs> you. really do spend as much time with your co-workers as you do with your own family in a lot of cases. It's important that the, the work environment is a kind of a familial environment, and the work is a place where you feel warm and valued and embraced, that you have enough flexibility to be creative and to run with ideas. It's absolutely critical, and the more that we can instill kindness, empathy, and love into the workplace, the stronger the workplace becomes, and the more, but the better positioned we are to accomplish extraordinary things. So I encourage everybody to seek that out. I mean, there's no, I mean, you want to reduce turnover rates, make work fun. You know, we want to make Monday feel as exciting as, as Friday. You know, you don't want to be like, oh God, I can't wait for Friday. You know, if you, that's, if that's how it is where you work, where you work, come on, man. You know, we got to do better than that. Um, I got to say, Brian is a ninja in making work fun. We do all kinds of corny stuff. We have a t-shirt cannon. Yeah. People <laughs> playing, uh, you know, throwing contests, lots of drinking, uh, all kinds of things. <laughs> We have a good time, though. It's, it's fun. It's fun to uh, get out there and stretch your legs and uh, kind of act like a family. So this is our Alpine staff, by the way, and uh, that's Sean and her crew, and they have all kinds of parties, you know, staff parties and holiday parties. They do, take care of each other. They invite you sometimes. They come eat their food. It's awesome. <laughs> and uh, yes, that's the type of thing important. Break bread together. Spend time together. Work with your friends. Be friends. I didn't know anybody at KDL when I came. I didn't know a single person. And now, I just I love everybody I work with. And I think this whole notion that directors can't be friends with their employees is a load of horse crap. I really do, down to my core. I feel like if, if you feel isolated because you're a director, you're doing it the exact wrong way. I think that if you're a real director, a good director, you should come in and feel like you're on an excellent journey with your best friends every time you walk through the door. You know, you're a part of a one gear in a big machine. The story isn't about you, it's about the team. You know, if you're a really good director, you know what you do? You pick everybody up. You know, you give them what they need to be successful. You're vulnerable. You don't need to be afraid because you're among your family. And that's the right way to do it. Looking like on time. We still got 15. We got some ground cover still. <laughs> Let me tell you something about libraries. Everything in libraries can be replicated elsewhere, for the most part, easily, most of the time for free, except you. You can't be replicated elsewhere. Truly, the most important thing, in my opinion, and I'm not Yoda of libraries or anything, 
little Star Wars reference. I'm more of a Star Wars person than a Trekkie. Just I'm going to go on record and see that right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. I'll be back later. Um, <laughs> what you offer, your customer service, your kindness, your empathy, your love, your connection to people is why people come in the lobby. They need stuff, but they come in to see you too. You want to make them, if I make a Cheers reference, so people understand what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Because I was thinking about this, like I'm talking, I'm getting old. I'm going to talk about Cheers. I'm going to talk about Norm, and people are going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> so in Cheers, we really truly want everybody to feel like Norm when they walk in the door. You know, Norm, yeah, we want that to be our brand. Like, yeah, I'm so glad you're here. You know, I love you. Thanks for coming in here today. How are the kids? What you up to? You know, I mean, you're like, mall crap out of people unless they don't want to be mall. I think that a really good library employee is very much like a very good bartender. A really good bartender will have regulars, and a really good bartender will know they drink, and a really good bartender will have them sit on the counter place sit down, and a really good bartender will know if they can talk to that person or not, and when, and they'll also know what to talk about. They'll know what's safe and what's not safe. And that's kind of why, uh, you know, Brian developed his assessment tool that he's going to talk to you about later is we want to try to figure out who has those qualities. We want to know who's willing to make that commitment to get to know people, to be that vulnerable, to be that involved with what's going on. Because that's what it's going to take. Because we're going to be around for another thousand years. We've been around for three thousand. We've been doing the same thing for three thousand years. We need to be around for another three thousand years. And the way we're going to do that is to keep waking up, trying hard, getting knocked down, and standing up again and realizing that people are the most important part of the equation. So at KDL, we have developed the KDL way. This is where it's getting a little culty, don't judge me. <laughs> the KDL way is a relationship-focused service. Um, the whole is based on kindness, empathy, and love. It's customer service driven. Customer service is our niche. People are our niche. You can't automate that. That's a face-to-face, -face, that's an interaction, that's important. You know, think of the places where you go. I mean, great service, you can have good food, but the, the service is bad, and you don't feel welcome there, you're not going to go back. But you go to a mediocre restaurant that has crappy food, and you really like the waitress or waiter or something, you know, as long as the prices are good. <laughs> so, we provide relationship-focused service by creating solid relationships through attention to a heartfelt commitment to serve with no expectation in return. The KDL way means we put serving people first by making connections and working to find solutions and accommodations for problems that arise through the lens of kindness and empathy. Our goal is to take great customer service up a notch and to create a more genuine style that focuses on individual needs. The KDL way is selfless. And good leadership is selfless, and our profession should be selfless. And that's what it's all about. Truly, library staff are in the best position to make this social connection, to make this change, to be the prow of the ship. They're, they're the face of the library. It's not just librarians. It's anybody who works in the library, anybody that the public sees. That's a librarian. Is it right? No. Not technically, but the public doesn't care, you know. So we have some stats here which are extremely interesting and very abstract. 63% um, of the consumers point to service as the most is the most important factor in the choice of their brand. 44% have a higher customer service expectation than they had a year ago. 70% say they are likely to switch brands if they deal with agents who are unable to answer their questions. And 62% have actually switched brands in the past year due to poor customer service. Now, just as an example, you're like, yeah, right? I mean, they're abstractions, but it's very important. It's an important consideration. Customer service is critical, and that's something that we can provide. It, 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 it really, like, lock people down and recognize that's our niche. That's who we are. We transform lives by connecting people with things that they're interested in, by touching their hearts, by figuring out what makes them tick and lifting them up. Our service priorities are a list of priorities that guide us in building procedures 
in our decision making and staff use these priorities to help make sound judgment and they really boil down to convenience, efficiency, consistency, and protection of materials. Because even when we're going forth with kindness and understanding, empathy, and love, we must not forget their procedures that make sure we are being consistent with other patrons and not infringing on their rights. We have service goals, which are a set of simple objectives that help staff get started in providing relationship-focused service. And they're stated, they're labeled the KDL way. And with the service goals are directions. Because we're librarians and we like directions. And here they are, right here. And so we have these available for the staff and we train this because of what we do is architected, it's intentional, it's, it's done purposefully. And so it's important to have very simplistic, straightforward directions so people know what the expectations are and they know what they're responsible for. I'll have these at our booth if you want to look some over. I'm going to rant about advocacy here for about five minutes. Are any of you aware of the OCLC study that got done this year? Yeah? No? Reach your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So there was a voter perception survey that was done by OCLC in 2008. And 73% of the people that were polled said they would vote yes in a library millage. The same survey was done this year. And 58% of the people polled so they were likely to vote on a library millage. So let me tell you, friends, we've got a big old problem. A problem of our own making. We need to get out in front of folks, let them know what we're all about. Let them know why we're important. Get them to come in and use the service. And you know how you're going to do that? You're going to tell your story. You need to tell your story. Tell a story that makes your heart go thumpy, thump, thump, thump. Don't tell the company's story. Don't spit statistics. Tell your story. Tell something that's meaningful to you. Because if it's meaningful to you, it'll be meaningful to other people. Because your story is our story. And everybody in this room has a duty and an obligation to do this. We need to switch this around. We need to move that dial back. We need to let people know what we're all about. We need to stand up. I, this is a call to action. We have an army already. We just got to get ourselves together and get people out there. We want to have other people. We want to inspire them, our patrons, to tell their stories to each other, to decision makers, to anybody who listen. The stories are going to buoy us through this storm. We live in a digital age. So what? We're going to stand up and tell our stories because what we're about is people. Libraries about people, not books. Libraries about people. So we're going to tell the people stories. We're going to touch lives, we're going to transform people, we're going to make a difference. And if you're not willing to do that, then I suggest you walk out of here right now. Because I don't have time for you. Because this is, this is a family. And we're going to win because we're all going to pull the rope the same way. So get out there, tell your stories. I have a really short exercise. I don't know if we have time for it, guys. How about just, I'm going to give you two minutes. I want you to tell a story to the same person you introduced yourself before. I want you to tell a very quick story about something that touched your heart. Two minutes, go. positivity into the world. And that becomes library's new brand. And I, 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 I encourage you to work on it and be brave. Stand up. This is important. This is important. What we do is critical. I think you should incorporate kindness, empathy, and love into your organization's DNA. It needs to be your brand. Because at the end of the day, our brand's not shh. Our brand needs to be hey. Come on. <laughs> Thank you.